Good evening, I'm Ziad Parvez. I'm Geraldine Sen. Traditional wisdom holders of the Pacific converged from June 11th to 14th in Suva for the first ever Pacific Philosophy Conference. A chance to learn from the wise in the region, the conference was aimed at finding a new development narrative for the Pacific. To discuss this, we have with us Ms. Emile Duituturanga, Executive Director of the Pacific Islands Association of Non-Governmental Organizations, otherwise known as Piango, together with Reverend Professor Upolu Va'ai of the Pacific Theological College. Welcome to the show. Thank you. To start off, it's very interesting this concept of the new development narrative for the Pacific. Could you please explain what this means? Thank you, Ziad. Um, in every other region in the world, they have their own philosophies. <clears throat> um, from Europe to Africa and to Asia and to other parts of the world, the question that has been asked by all of us, um, not only academics but also um, NGOs and other organizations, is that does the Pacific has a philosophy or philosophies? And then we came to the conclusion that um, we have to look at this topic because it's very, very important. Um, and if we have a philosophy or philosophies, does it or do they have the potential to create a Pacific we want, a sustainable Pacific we want? The reason why I say that is that philosophy is the foundations, the underpinnings of development. Mm -hmm. So if we want to rewrite the narrative, uh, for example, the development narrative, not only that we need to rewrite the narrative, but we have to look at the foundation of that narrative because it has to come from within. It has to come from the local communities. And that's why we came up with the idea of having a philosophy conference, the inaugural philosophy conference, which is why we uh, came together, not only uh, our um, institution that I work uh, with, Pacific Theological College, has been here for 53, 54 years now, uh, but also with uh, USB, FNU, as well as, um, as Biango. To partner in this is a very important uh, topic uh, because when we talk about development, we have to look at firstly, uh, what are the philosophical underpinnings of that development narrative. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting, this mm. uh, collaboration between NGOs and the Pacific Theological College. How did this happen? Well, a couple of years ago, uh, the Pacific Theological College had convened um, a gathering of other academics from other parts of the Pacific here in Fiji, and we were invited to that, where um, it, it became obvious that in, in order to um, continue to think around the key theme of, and it was called uh, hermeneutics relationality, or well, you know, us NGOs, hermeneutics what? And so what, what was important about that is that it began a process of realization, particularly for, for NGOs who work in the communities. We have lots of social problems. Um, we've, we've been in this you know, process for the last five years where we're realizing that you know, maybe uh, some of the way we understand development needs to be questioned. Uh, maybe our academics who have thought about this may have something to offer us. And so the idea was that we need to bring together practitioners and academics together to um, consider what uh, Reverend Dr. Upolu is talking about in terms of the Pacific philosophy. On that note, this is the inaugural one. You would think that when you start off something for the first time, that it would start off pretty small. But it's been done on substantially quite a large scale for the first one. You've got a lot of different uh, people coming in from different parts of the Pacific. They've got their own different ideas and all. How did the conference go? Because you must have had a lot of different events happening. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's, it's an exciting event that we had. Um, of course, we started really small. And uh, just the heads of these four institutions that we're discussing. But then there were a lot of partners that were interested and a lot of participants that wanted to attend the conference and then this whole idea about philosophy um, trying to explain to our people because it's a you know once you hear the word philosophy itself it's even scarier mm -hmm. yeah. because of the way 
the education, uh, the Western education system treated the word, um, but we have a different understanding of philosophy, which is more practical, which is more, um, you know, couched in the, the multi-dimensional relationships. Mm -hmm. um, so the interest was there, but you know, the the Pacific has been uh, um, engaged in what we call decolonization for a very long time. Not mm -hmm. only political mm -hmm. decolonization, but educational decolonization, development decolonization. <clears throat> And I think the, this would be the first time for us to come together, not, not the first time to develop a philosophy, but it's the first time that philosophers and wisdom uh, custodians from around the region mm -hmm. have congregated in one room and one platform and say, okay, let's develop a philosophy for the, for the region. Um, and also acknowledging the, the diverse, you know, contexts and mm -hmm. philosophies that come out of the different parts of the, of the region, which mm -hmm. is why there is a lot of interest, because once you talk about development, mm -hmm. you it have a, to have the foundation. It was a deliberate mm -hmm. um, yeah. uh, decision to take a regional approach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But with so much diversity in one space, how did you ensure that you received uh, or you got like one outcome that you wanted? Well, I think the, uh, you, you know, the, that was the whole idea because we all have different understandings of this. And so um, the design of it uh, was to look at what are the key pillars, um, you know, navigation, land. So when you, and, and this is where the academics, uh, you know, um, helped to design this in terms of, okay, if you're looking at the philosophies, if you're looking at philosophy, what are the key tenets of that? And so it was almost an exploration of, okay, are there, are there common commonalities? So the idea of, of, of having a, a, a high chief from Samoa, um, of uh, an academic from Hawaii, mm -hmm. um, of hearing uh, from a chief uh, here in, in Fiji, uh, from a master navigator. Mm -hmm. And you know what? There were commonalities. There were real common themes that, that kept coming through. Well, that's amazing to hear. Um, you will agree with me when I say that there is a very limited uh, body of literature around the Pacific. For example, r the writings of uh, the late Dr. Epeli Haofa. Yeah. Are, you, are you diverging from that or are you building on that? It's, it's really the continuation. It's the continuity of the dream mm. that was put forth by Epeli Haofa. Um, so we are dancing in that rhythm uh, that Epilia Wolf has, has um, you know, out in the, about um, uh, a decade ago. Mm. And here we are trying to sit together because uh, we cannot, we didn't really come to the conference in it's just having a philosophy conference. Mm. The reason why, and, and maybe like for myself, an academic, when a student writer writes, want to write a thesis, I will always have to look first, what is the problem of the thesis? Well, in the interest of time, we'll have to cut to a break, but I would really like to discuss some um, educational decolonization that you mentioned. All of that right after the break. Welcome back. We're now joined by Dr. Francis Vakauta, Director, Oceania Center for Arts, Culture and Pacific Studies at the University of the South Pacific, together with Professor Unaisi Nambombombamba from the Fiji National University. To begin with, we were discussing educational decolonization. How important is that? Not just political decolonization, but decolonization of the mind. Thank you for that very good question. It was Franz Fanon. He was the thinker, the original thinker that said, uh, decolonization is important, but decolonization of the mind is the most important because even if you were to gain political decolonization and people do not change their mindsets, uh, nothing really changes. And especially for the Pacific, especially for developing countries, especially for Pacific people, 10 million of us in the world with one, you know, with 1,500 languages of the world's 6,000 languages. Mm -hmm. Very important to decolonize the mind so that people understand that in our region for 5,000, 6,000 years, we've lived with knowledge systems 
just like everywhere, everywhere else. And Professor, uh, sorry, Dr. Francis, uh, what, what exactly do you mean by decolonization of the mind? Have you come across um, instances where you, um, because you interact a lot with students, right? We both do. Yeah. Yes. Thank you for that. Um, I think it's really important, I think, at the onset to say that this is not a new conversation. This is an ongoing conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the conversation, of course, started with uh, gaining independence for many of our countries. Unfortunately, in our region, we have many countries which are still under colonial rule. Um, we may not name it that way, but that's the reality. Um, and for others we, who may have gained independence, we still, of course, have the politics of aid, mm -hmm. which means that autonomy, full autonomy, has not really arrived yet. Mm -hmm. um, but this is not a new conversation about decolonization of the mind or of development or of politics. Um, and there have been many pocket movements mm -hmm. to try and establish this self-determinization, mm -hmm. um, self-realization, uh, yeah. chartering our own journey. Mm -hmm. In academia, we have had many giants over the years who really have started this journey. Um, this conference was our effort to, to stand up and take responsibility and leadership to say, well, yes, good things have happened, uh, many lessons learned, some things we could do better, um, and how do we more purposefully mobilize and coordinate those efforts to bring about greater change? Because the pocket changes are not giving us or reaping the rewards that we would like to see. Mm -hmm. um, we still see so many constraints. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, colonialism and Christianity and education, the three big, mm -hmm. um, I guess, colonizing movements in their own way, have well and truly conditioned the vast majority of our peoples to belittle and undermine ourselves. Mm -hmm. And on that note, of mm. course, one may say, mm. or at least I would say, mm. that one of the purposes for having this conference would, of course, to get us to get in touch with our roots again, like you said, with education. It Absolutely. Comes, it has a domino mm. effect. Mm. Yeah. Uh, like Frances was saying, I worked with her for at least 20 years at the University of the South Pacific. Uh, it is a very hard uh, wall to knock mm. because our people have been conditioned mm -hmm. to like the other, if you like, to like the colonizer. Mm -hmm. So she referred to the 30, 40 years of work in the Pacific Islands. They have been in Fiji, for example, mm -hmm. the 1969 commission. In uh, Solomon Islands, the, the Bogotu, uh, education for what, in 1970. Mm -hmm. In Kiribati, the uh, Trage report, 1974. There have been commissions on this all over the Pacific and also at USB in, uh, in um, very early, in the early 1970, the UNDP got together Pacific educators like Professor Helen Feynman, mm. like Professor Tupenimbamba, my husband, um, to, to rewrite the curriculum, to decolonize it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like Francis said, we stand on uh, on shoulders, Epel, the late Professor Epeliha Offa, mm -hmm. we stand on, in this conference mm -hmm. on shoulders of giants in the Pacific mm -hmm. who go, who'd gone before us mm -hmm. to do exactly this. And when you said the people of the Pacific are conditioned, um, I'm guessing you meant that our colonial legacies are largely institutionalized. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there should be a grassroots approach to this, to decolonizing our minds? I think that for, for many of us working in the area of education, we've recognized the need to decolonize our school curriculum from basic education up. Um, but this conference, I think what it does, it's a milestone event for us because there have been movements from the bottom up, CSOs are doing amazing work on the ground, academia trying to do work, the church and theology trying to do work. But in many ways, we're working in isolation. And so this was an attempt to kind of come together and recognize the synergy in those efforts. Yeah, it does like, uh, you know, with Frances, some of us, she's not letting on. Over the years, for me, at least almost 30 years, for her, uh, she's, she's a little polite, yeah, but uh, we don't just work in universities. We have worked with, uh, for example, at the Fijian Teachers Association. Mm -hmm. There are people working with this, decolonizing, doing research in indigenous Fijian communities. Mm -hmm. Because Professor Subraman has alluded to that, Unesi, you know, 
uh, you kind of need to do writing. Mm -hmm. We uh, Indian Fijians have started a long time ago, you know, with Gandhi. So all over the world, I wanted to say before we go off, eh? mm -hmm. uh, all over the world there are uh, Indian philosophers, you know, that we use at universities, Spivak, Gandhi. And when you go to Europe, there's so many more, eh? mm -hmm. you know, begin with Shakespeare, with all these uh, writers, and African thought, mm -hmm. and, and uh, Native American thought. This idea is to also bring in Pacific Island thought, mm -hmm. because to not have that is to basically say, we didn't have brains. I see. On that note, taking a look at what was spoken about, you had at the uh, conference itself, there weren't just speakers. You had a variety of different things that were happening. You had poets that were there. There were dances, of course, exhibitions as well. But uh, just quickly, before we get into all of that, uh, Ratu Semi Siruvakula, mm -hmm. he happened to write something about the uh, indigenous economy and the uh, Vanua economy. Most people don't realize what that means because you just go about a daily life. Could you tell us more? Like uh, the late uh, Professor Asisela Ravuvu, like uh, Dr. Elaitia Sevati Tuere, mm -hmm. uh, Ratu Semi Serubakula, and I, I've just joined the boat uh, in 1990s. Mm -hmm. We, uh, well, after traveling around the world, you, you realize that there's absence of anybody, mm -hmm. the literature. Now, it doesn't mean it's absent. It's just not recorded and documented because of our oral cultures. Ratusemi Seruvakula's uh, first book that came out in 2000 is called Nambula Bakavanua, mm -hmm. out of IPS USB. Yeah. Uh, in that book, he details how the structures of the Fijian is, is, you know, exists. Mm -hmm. Because Fijians, uh, like Samoans, like Hawaiians, like anybody else in the world, in their traditional setup outside of modernity, have their own form of government. Mm -hmm. So Ratsemi, his, uh, his whole engagement has been to explain that, eh? to detail that. That, of course, is also part of, he is also the, the chair of the Retired Teachers Association, mm -hmm. uh, based out of the Institute at FTA, the Fijian Teachers Association. This is the work they do. Well, that's really interesting. And um, I'm sure you must agree when I say that, um, uh, around Fijian culture and in fact most of Pacific culture there are a lot of myths that are imposed on us mm -hmm. and debunking those myths is really important um, I'd like to definitely discuss that in the following segments but all of that after the break welcome back now, uh, Dr. Francis, we were speaking earlier on about the different things that took place at the conference. One of the things that really interested me, even though I wasn't there, was the arts. Because when you look at Pacific uh, theology itself, oh, oh, sorry, not theology, philosophy, most of the information, most of the ideas are passed down through the arts. Mm -hmm. And how did that go about in the conference? Thank you for the question. I think it's a, a really critical one. Mm -hmm. um, when we talk about Pacific ways of knowing or Pacific epistemology, our immediate go-to is Western framings of a philosophy and epistemology. And we think words, and we mm. think text. Yeah. Uh, but as we know, Pacific cultures were predominantly oral cultures. Um, along the way, as a result of colonization and education, um, our people have been reduced to very small cultural practice spaces which means that for a lot of our young people, they don't realize that our ways of knowing actually encaptures the arts. Um, and so the symbols, our written text through the tapa, for example, through our symbols um, in our carvings, and they, they, they actually contain narratives. Um, and so bringing in the arts into the conference space may seem unusual, but from a Pacific perspective, mm -hmm. it's very natural and is actually part of decolonizing the conversation about philosophy mm -hmm. and epistemology. So having poets in the room is reminiscent of our orators mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and chanting. And we had a wonderful evening session with Professor Mahina from New Zealand um, where they had snippets of mm -hmm. traditional love poetry um, and the nose flute um, and just talking about that. The and, nose flute? and the nose flute, the Tongan nose flute. Um, that was beautiful. And then having contemporary uh, poets, spoken word artists, being able to share their views as well. Just this kind of a reclaiming 
alternative ways of knowing and being. Mm -hmm. We also had the visual artists, we had mm -hmm. dance performances. We were, of course, constrained by three days, but we tried our very, very best to capture as many ways of knowing as we could in that short period of time. When you say reclaiming that knowledge, um, have we lost a lot of that artistic symbolism? We've lost some of it. We haven't lost all of it. Um, but when I say reclaim, I'm talking more about reclaiming a space. Mm -hmm. um, we don't offer those spaces, mm -hmm. and so our arts are reduced to handicraft markets. They're not handicrafts. Mm -hmm. They're heritage arts, rich cultural, spiritual significance. Mm -hmm. We need to reclaim a space where they're valued and recognized mm -hmm. for the philosophy, mm -hmm. for the epistemology, for the knowledge that it contains. Well, Ms. Emily, we, um, well, let's get back to decolonization itself. Do you do a lot of work um, through Piengo uh, with uh, school settings or, or ch children to d develop that idea of decolonization? We work with what we call next generation leadership, you know, younger people, mm -hmm. uh, those who are involved in community work, in youth work, working at the community level. And, and the reason being is that, you know, when we think about how, you know, how do we transmit or who, who is this for? Um, and it brings into focus the younger generation. I mean, Fiji's just had their census that tells us 70% of the population are 40 years younger. Mm -hmm. So about five years ago, we came to the realization that this is about intergenerational work. Mm -hmm. um, those of us uh, and, and the elders, and that was the, the really unique um, element of this conference, the elders, the wisdom holders, they were in the same room three days with younger people, mm -hmm. village leaders, chiefs, mm -hmm. um, church leaders. Mm -hmm. And so for the younger generation, I mean, we all talk about sustainable development, you know, future for, for, for future generations. So the work that Piango has been doing in, in decolonizing the mind, our younger people now have technology. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're more, you know, in, uh, taken up with, you know, Facebook, all of that. Oh, that's so we've true. got that competition. And now how do we find ways mm -hmm. that the wisdom and the heritage and the knowledge that they need mm -hmm. is transmitted to them? Of course, both being from, the acad from academia, it would be difficult to get the message across, like you said, with text. Yes. But then again, with the uh, educational framework being the way it is, we used to go to school. If it doesn't come from a book, it's not true. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to yep. believe it. Mm -hmm. Is that a challenge that you think that uh, elders face now? Oh, absolutely. Um, and I think that the choices of the elders uh, was very important mm -hmm. because each speaker in the room has spent a lifetime at this work. Mm -hmm. um, at spreading that message that, that culture provides the foundation. And that's not to say that we're living in the past. Mm -hmm. The quality of our future will be determined by the lessons learned mm -hmm. and our ability to take what the best of our culture forward with new technology, mm -hmm. with advancement. That is the only way we can achieve the sustainability that we would like to see. Now, Miss Emily, going back to the conference itself, um, when you put a group of uh, elders into a space with youths, how do you ensure that there's a good flow of conversation and ideas? Well, it was a challenge because we had eminent elders. I mean, they were just not your ordinary um, uh, elders. And so it was important to give them that space, but we had to create space also for the younger, younger, uh, younger participants. And so what we did was, at the end of the day, from 5 to 7, there was a specific program mm -hmm. facilitated mm -hmm. in order for the younger ones to ask questions, to make sense of what was being uh, spoken about. And then on the third day, there were panels. We had panels of church leaders, panels of civil society leaders, panels of academics, and there was a panel of the younger people to then share what they thought, what their reflections were. Because in a space like that, it's really important to strike a good balance between all of the different um, diversities that you have within one conference. I um, given the Pacific culture, it's infiltrated uh, down through generations that elders speak, youngers listen. Mm. We'll discuss more about balancing the narrative right after the break. <music> Welcome back. Earlier we were discussing balancing the narrative, but before we get into that, Dr. Una, I understand that you've written about the role of theology in all of this? Mm. Um, 
Let me just say that, uh, yes, my master's degree looked at the role of higher education institutions in Fiji, how they came about and what sorts of ideas were they built on. In that, one has to acknowledge that in academia at least, and in Fiji, the role of the theolo theologians uh, in decolonizing academy, in decolonizing thinking, we have to recognize. Uh, this is talking as early as the 1960s, 70s, 80s, with the formation of SPATS, the South Pacific Association of Theological Schools, with coconut theology of the 80s and 70s, but Dr. Elaitia Sevati Tuere, Dr. Meo Halapua, and the like. So these, these were people, Thornley, these were names that taught those of us in academia, you know, that it is okay to decolonize academy, it is okay to offer a narrative that is not coming from elsewhere, that is specific, that is rooted in our consciousness, rooted in the landscape of our people. This is where I think the Pacific Theological College, in the person of the Associate Professor, the Reverend Dr. Upoluva I, took leadership this time, and I thought it's a place well suited. Well, uh, Reverend Doctor, looking at theology itself, how do you make sure that there's a balance with, without upsetting someone, having to decolonize something? Because in the Pacific, we have become so used to it. If the church says this, then that is that. But it, con it, it creates a bit of a conflict because looking at traditional, in the traditional sense, ide uh, the ideas there may, may have some sort of conflict there, may be, may be contrasting. How do, you, how do you strike the perfect balance? Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a good question, but it's also a difficult question for all of us to answer. Mm. Um, let, me, let me talk about the role of theology. Mm -hmm. uh, theology is based on the Bible, right. but it's informed by philosophy. Mm -hmm. But the responsibility of theology is to articulate and address the current issues that the people and the societies, uh, and that's really the role of the church. Mm -hmm. The role of the church through its theology as a tool is to articulate and addresses the issues, which is why we came to this, uh, to the idea of the theme of the conference, which we haven't uh, covered. Um, the theme is really based on the relationality, the idea of relationality, which for the church, um, the whole of the Bible, mm -hmm. it's about relationship, it's about relationality. So we can have any relationships. We can have political, family, economic relationship, whatever relationships that we have. But if we don't have relationality, relationship doesn't work. So relationships focus on the, um, the interactions of people, the connections of people. Relationality is about the quality of that relationship. So you're not relational if you don't have the quality of, of the relationship. Uh, so the whole discussion of the whole conference mm -hmm. was about relationality. Not only the, the, the philosophy of relationality, but also how that, does, that, that philosophy informed the theology of the church mm -hmm. to address the issues. And if you see now, there are a lot of issues, like ecological issues, environmental issues, mm -hmm. the issues of um, the violence, mm -hmm. um, domestic violence, um, and all of these issues. These issues, the theology of the church has to address these issues. Mm -hmm. But sometimes also, the church is too confined within itself mm -hmm. and too doctrinal oriented that mm -hmm. sometimes it misses the point mm -hmm. that Jesus taught us, mm -hmm. as well as other uh, religions have also done. And the point is that love is overarching. Love is about everything, and that's the, that's the main bulk of, uh, of the theology. And the mission of the church mm -hmm. is to spread love in a sense that um, we have to tackle the issues. Well, I'm going to stray from that a little. Uh, when mm -hmm. you mentioned relationality, um, I remember a very interesting paper by Reverend Dr. Tuere at the conference uh, where he spoke about the Vanua and its interconnectedness with identity. Mm -hmm. Could you explain more about that? Yes, the Reverend Dr. Elaitia Sevati Tuwere uh, is, a, is a distinguished Fijian scholar. Mm -hmm. He Let me talk about her, his background first, because huh? it will throw light to that. He's a theologian. He was the principal, former principal of the Pacific Theological College, where the Reverend Dr. Upolu is at the moment. Then he was taken to New Zealand to lead the Methodist Church. He also was an academic. 
and a theologian in New Zealand at the University of Auckland, where he was teaching what, you, what we are talking about today at the St. John's College in Remuera. So yes, um, Tuere was brought by our team with uh, Dr. Upolu's lead because of his long-term engagement with this topic of Anua theology. He wrote a PhD in 1992 on this, and the book followed 10 years later in 2002, Manua Theology of Place. The, whole, the essence of it is, and uh, you know, it has leanings also to earlier work by our keynote, to your tour to Port Masese of Samoa, head of state. And that is uh, on the fact that there are in all the world's cultures spirituality. Mm -hmm. And before the Christian God was brought to the Pacific, there is the Vanua and all its deity in all its spirituality. Mm -hmm. To poor Tamasese, uh, like Dr. Upolu, like uh, Professor Upolu and uh, Dr. Tuere, they raise the issue when you're looking at the Vanua, the whole concept of the indigenous Fijian, for example, um, and everybody that lives in a Vanua or a tribal area, like Taveuni. When there is a chief, there is a people, there is animals, there is land, and everybody else, regardless of who they are. The Vanua is encapsulates that and should be uh, embraced, and the chief is the emblem of service, mm -hmm. you know, made a chief because he is the best server, and looking after people's interests. When I say people, it means everybody, not only the indigenous Fijian. So Vanua theology is the interconnected relationship of all the spiritualities. And Tuya Tua to Port Tamasese head of state Samoa asked the question, in all the 5,000, 6,000 years we were in the Pacific with our own theologies. Uh, and, and Christianity came 150 years ago. Does it mean there was no God? Mm. That is what un, uh, Dr. Tuere answered in that book, at least for the indigenous Fijian, that we embrace who we are. Well, I'd definitely like to explore more on that. It's a very interesting topic, it's his area. but that, we'll leave that for the final segment. We'll be right back after the break. Welcome back. Dr. Vai, we were discussing the balance between cultural spirituality and religion. Can religion uh, recognize most of the spiritual institutions that we have, or the cultural institutions that we have in the Pacific? Definitely, um, which is why this conference is very important, because we look at the spirituality of the indigenous people, or even the Pacific um, as a whole, and how does that inform the theology of the church? Because sometimes also the, the notion that has been around in the mind of the church is that spirituality belongs to the church and is owned by the church. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes it's locked inside of the church. Mm -hmm. But it's not, if, if you focus on relationality, it means that spirituality is not locked in a space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's fluid, it, 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 it's holistic. And that's where the, um, the indigenous uh, spirituality come in. Taking things back to how the conference went, and of course the outcomes of it. It must have been very fruitful, seeing as though you're all happy about it. Do you have documentation though that you can share? Of course you have to share knowledge with something like this. You can't just translate it through word of mouth. Do you have any publications that would be published, any videos? Absolutely. Um, so as in most of the conferences that we have uh, engaged in, we like to ensure that there will be a publication document. Um, and so Reverend Dr. Upolu is taking the lead on, on that. Mm -hmm. Uh, initiative um, and on our part uh, in terms of USP contribution is we've documented, we have uh, video footage and what we're looking at is exactly that. How do you communicate this to young people? Mm. So looking at social media, looking at YouTube, looking at Facebook, uh, looking at ways of creating very short videos that can be consumed by the digital natives today. Mm -hmm. um, definitely. And as a follow-on of course both through each of our institutions, as well as through the Next Generation uh, Leadership Program through Piango mm. and FCOS, uh, looking at ways of, of creating materials and resources, not just for these young people in our communities, but for our students at our institutions as well, and how we can work together to create these resources. 
Now, doc, uh, Reverend Doctor, your takeaway from this conference, do you think that there's a need for another one, maybe to make it an annual event? Of course, the, the, the work um, in Okro uh, will, will lead us to that there a, a, could be another one. So uh, there, there is a possibility of having another one. Uh, it's just that we didn't sit down really there now because it just the conference is finished. And then um, we have to decide uh, probably two or three years. Um, then we're going to ha have a look at um, another conference. And how we do that, we don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, we just don't uh, um, unwind now and uh, look at the, you know. To plan something program, like that, the logistics We can expect more force. cooperation <coughs> from Viengo and other organizations. Yes, like yes. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of um, other interested partners that are now coming in and interested in, in this whole thing. So the pool of uh, coordination and also networking is now becoming wider and wider of the interest in the, in the whole Pacific community in that. In the interest of mm. having another one, of course, it would be wise to go out into the public to reach out and find out, you know, has there been any change yet? Has there been any more loss of knowledge? Or has, there, has your uh, publications actually, or ha will they actually make a difference then? Absolutely. And we also have to look beyond academic texts mm. because that closes knowledge in an mm. academic space. Mm. We have to look at unpackaging that for the everyday consumer. Um, and of course, that's where the media comes in. How do we then partner with the media to get these messages across? Mm. Mm. Um, is, it, is it possible that I would, um, I would like to acknowledge uh, some of the partners? And sure. Um, first of all, um, let me, um, as a chief uh, convener of the, of the conference, um, let me try to acknowledge some of the you know, very important uh, organizations and persons who have been working hard for this. Of course, we have Dr. Francis here, the director of the Shannon Center of the USB. She has been very supportive of all of this. And, uh, and then we have Bianco, um, Emily Duduituranga, who is the executive director of Bianco. Um, she supported us, and uh, she was the major, um, Bianco was the major funding uh, partner in all of this. And then we have FNU, mm -hmm. of course, the vice chancellor as well as pro vice chancellor and uh, Professor Una came in uh, with a lot of support. And then we have the uh, Professor Nokise from uh, Pacific Theological College and the community who have been very supportive mm -hmm. for all of this as well as FCO. So we were so we are so appreciative of their support, and I we we cannot have words but to thank them very much. For their and support. We're looking forward to conferences like this in the future. Thank you. Very That's much. all we have time for tonight. We hope you enjoyed the show for tonight. Until we meet again, good evening.